I can go through a timeline of my life and tell you incidents that happen that there is no denying that I didn't have God's guidance or there wasn't an angel there to pull me out of something very quickly. Okay, Mommy Millionaires, I am so excited for all of you to be on today's podcast. We are interviewing an ambitious, amazing mom, and I know that you are going to find things that you have in common with her. You're going to be inspired by her. She represents the word grit, and grit is defined as a personality trait possessed by individuals who demonstrate passion and perseverance towards a goal despite being confronted by significant obstacles and distractions. It's a truly noble characteristic that leads to success in all aspects of life, in your relationships, in business, and with your family. So today, I am so excited to bring on my friend, Katherine Gordon. She's a relationship expert. She is a businesswoman. She has an incredible podcast called Catherine for Real. She's also an investor and a best-selling author of Relationship Grit. So let's welcome Catherine to the show. But first, I want to share with you how I met her. You know, you've heard Candy Valentino on the podcast before. And Candy reached out to me, I think it was like a year ago, maybe at this point, and said, hey, do you want to invest in this, you know, short-term rental up in Carmel? You know, it's only four other amazing women that are coming in on this deal. You need to have $500,000. If you want in, show me proof of funds right now and I'll put you in on the text. Like we're going to make an offer. And I was like, there's something inside of me that was just like, yes, do it. (laughs) So I'm like going into my bank account, sending screenshots to Candy. (laughs) And um, all of a sudden I got to meet this amazing woman on the other group text. Her name was Catherine Gordon. She was coming in on this crazy deal. We ended up not getting the piece of real estate, but I did get to make a connection with Catherine Gordon. So it's so exciting to have you on the show, Catherine. Oh, thank you so much. What a beautiful, beautiful way to introduce me. I love that. But I think we need to let people know because this is so neat. What were we going to be investing in? Because that's what made it so fun. Right. It was, it was, it it was was Betty Betty. White's personal home. Yes. So from the golden girls and we were going to call our LLC, the golden girls. We were going to have it as a short-term rental place and a place where we could hold events. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. we'll have to, we'll have to look for another place since that one didn't work out. We were out. Right. (laughs) I know they, I think they ended up, you know, tearing it down. Oh, they did. Yeah. I think that's what I read. So I was like, so sad, but I'm glad that we got to meet you. And I think that was what the draw was too. It was like, this is so exciting. Kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity. So, you know, and we got to meet each other. So cool. I know. So Catherine, you know, I talked about the word grit because that's your best selling book, Relationship Grit. Would you describe yourself as a gritty kid growing up? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I grew up, my dad was in the Navy. So I literally went to five different elementary schools Wow! and we would move in the middle of the school year. And so it was like truly kill or be killed, right? <laughs> like not truly, but you know, like there was a lot of fist fighting. There was a lot of pulling hair. It was It was, it was rough. Those Navy kids. I mean, you know, we were all, I think, trying to survive on some level. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think grit for me, you know, I cultivated it early on. And I ask myself sometimes too, though, was grit really cultivated or did I always have it in me? And does everybody have grit? And I'm still trying to get the ultimate answer to that. But I don't know, because like my brothers, we all grew up in the same environment, but they reacted differently to their to the environment than I did. You know, they kind of one of them acted more like a victim, Mm -hmm. you know, and started, you know, acting out in a way like that. So I don't know. I, I think you can cultivate grit to a certain point. But then after that, you know, it's got to be what's innate. 
And maybe that comes from, I don't know, faith. Maybe it's, maybe you can actually summon it from faith. So Mm, that's so interesting because that you had a similar experience to me because, you know, my brother and I had, you know, the same experience growing up and he went one way and I went the other, you know, and it's like, people always ask, how did that happen? And, and I always say it was the favor of God on my life because, you know, I don't know how I didn't go down a dark path, you know, except my, except my faith and just going, I had, there was something that there was a bigger plan for, for me. And, you know, and I always pray for my brother that one day he figures, figures it out. Grit is such an interesting concept because I have three kids. I know you, you have two, right, Catherine? I have two. Yep. And, you know, mine are at this age where I have a almost 13 year old and he is like insane. I call him insane because he's just like, he's such a devoted athlete. I mean, he goes to a hockey school, he comes home and he plays hockey until he goes to sleep. Like he, it's, it's just like, it's innate in him. And then I yep. see my daughter. It's a very different story. Like, you know, she just like, it's, <laughs> she flies by the seat of her pants, you know? So it's interesting. I think it is in our DNA and I love knowing that you were put into a circumstance that kind of brought the grit out of you, mm-hmm. you know? So you were put in that type of environment. What were your parents like? Were they like, were they saying like, kill or be killed? Like, step up. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I thought this was very normal, but like, I really don't, my parents were not very involved, you know? And I mm-hmm. find out kind of like, I hear from other people, I'm like, really? Wow. My dad flew planes for the Navy, so he was gone all the time. He was flying all over the world, and, you know, he'd be gone for like six months at a time. And my mom, God bless her, she was this little four foot 11 woman from Newfoundland, Canada, with a seventh grade education. And so, you know, she had three kids, two boys. And by the way, my oldest brother, Jerry, she actually had because she was raped. Oh my goodness. She had moved down to Chicago from Newfoundland to nanny for this family. And the story goes, I don't, I sometimes think there might be something in there, but it was snowy and she used to send packages back to her family up in Newfoundland. And there was a guy that saw her and she was walking in the snow and he's like, just get in. I'll take you. Let me just take you. And apparently he raped her and left her in the snow to die. And at that point she was a virgin. So it's not like she knew. So she didn't even know she was pregnant until she was almost like six months pregnant. And she went up to Newfoundland to have my brother. And he lived with my nanny until he was five, until my mom met my father. So anyway, I didn't mean to go into that, but you talk about grit. And so, well, yeah, that's like, wow. Yeah. And so that just that kind of if that would paint a picture about this woman who was, you know, really in so many ways still immature, emotionally immature. And I found myself at a young age more parenting her in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so she did unfortunately become an alcoholic. My father was an alcoholic, but again, she was very functioning in that, like, you know, a lot of times when you think of alcoholics, you think of like, you know, the bottle, you know, the laying on the couch with the bottle and the house is a mess. My house was immaculate. My mother kept a immaculately clean home and she cooked so Well, I mean, we always, always had the most amazing home cooked meals. So, you know, in that way, it wasn't like your typical, we didn't eat type thing, but all in all, and still in all, they were alcoholics. And, you know, I can remember I was, I had a big test the next day. My dad had got home. He, I think he was in Okinawa, Japan for six months and he had gotten home. And of course, so they stayed up drinking and I woke up. And the music, this country music was blaring. And I walk out in the living room and I'm literally yelling at my parents to turn down the music because I had to get up in the morning to go to school. You know, and I think about some of that Mm. now, like, did that really, but it did really happen. You know, so of course you can imagine I became a totally different mother. My kids would probably tell you that I'm a complete helicopter mom because there was no way in hell my kids were going to do 
any of the things that I was doing. But, you know, my mom just wasn't a good disciplinarian. She really didn't know how to discipline us. And I was wild. So, yeah, I, I didn't have a lot of supervision. I did start doing drugs at a very early age. So I was, I think I, I smoked my first joint at 12 and I was like full fledged doing bong hits every day by 13. Yeah. Do you remember what made you want to do that when you were 12? You know, that is a really good question because I've never really thought about that. And the truth is when I look back, it was a good time. It wasn't like I was, you know, I, you know, my mm. life stinks. No, it was fun. Like I smoked my first joint with my oldest brother's girlfriend at the time. And she was a lot of fun. And I really looked up to her and, you know, so it was fun. We sat on the hill and we laughed and we laughed and we laughed. I mean, it was fun. I think, you know, then the question might be, well, why did you continue? And I guess in that point, you know, there's a lot of things there, right? It's environment. Then you start hanging around the people that do that. And then that starts to be what you do. And then there's the habit that falls in there. And, you know, so down the rabbit hole, down the path you go. So. So how did you eventually stop doing drugs? Well, there was a spot in there that I, I was at a friend's house and I smoked some pot that was laced with PCP. Oh, okay. And all I can remember was walking home and I was hallucinating. And I, I lived off of this like canal and there were all these ducks and so I'm walking on this concrete path and the ducks were like taking off and flying. And all I could hear, you know, I've talked about this on my own podcast, but you, you can hear it like it was like you see in the movies, you know, like, na, 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 wah, 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 oh wah, my goodness. Wah, 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 wah. And I was really disoriented. I made it home. My mom was home mopping the floor because she was always cleaning. And I literally just fell on the kitchen floor like, oh, my God, there's something wrong with me. But I kept coming in and out like I was really out of it. And all I remember is going back into my parents' room in the bathroom and just splashing water on my face. I don't know for how long. And I just looked in the mirror and I'm like, God, if you get me out of this, I will never smoke pot again. Mm. And I don't know how long it took or exactly, you know, what happened after that. But I, I remember just waking up in my bed and I thought, I'm never doing it again. And I never did smoke pot again. I did have flashbacks for many years, for several years after that. And that was very scary. It was a traumatic um, incident. Yeah. Yes. It was really scary. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I did end up finding a new drug that, you know, didn't make me spacey, but actually made me alert. And that was cocaine. Mm. And um, I mean, I don't know if you want to go through my drug history. But I have a drug history. <laughs> well, I think it's interesting because it's just the mindset of, you know, you had to have grit to get out of all this. You know, you said something at the very beginning of the podcast that I'm going to tell you is exactly the way I felt mm. through all of this. For some reason, I always did feel the presence of God, like mm. you're not going to do this. Like something would happen every time that would kind of get me out of the situation wow. and direct redirect me. I literally am starting to write down all of what I now think are probably testimonies. I don't, didn't see it at that as a time. I can go through a timeline of my life and tell you incidents that happen that there is no denying that I didn't have God's guidance or there wasn't an angel there to pull me out of something very quickly. And so I always felt that sense of like, oh, no, no, I'm not staying here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not staying here. And I've got bigger things to do. And so that did end up happening. And I ended up moving in with a guy who was uh, dealing cocaine and I stayed with him and you know, there were a lot of horrible nights of like, he beat the crap out of me, but I always knew intuitively, like, I got to get out of here. And so, you know, I ended up applying for college and I started out at the community college. My grades were horrible. I think I had like a 2.9 GPA, 
but I started out at community college, did a year there, brought my grades up, moved over to Old Dominion University, and ended up getting my, my college degree. And literally two weeks after I graduated, I moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and I never went back. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, that's such a, like a special story because, you know, it's like you had to, you had to start out small and some people like they could look at your life right now and think, oh my goodness, like it must've just been perfect. And I, I think that's why you had to go through some of those things that you went through, you know, is because now, you know, that mess becomes your message and you're going to save so many people, maybe that don't have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, but they're sabotaging themselves in some way by something. And, you know, it's this reminder that like, you're never too far gone. You know, I got to tell you something, and this is, this has been a real confirmation for me. So yep. Early on, I mean, there were ups and downs, we didn't need to go into every single drug story, but I found <laughs> ecstasy and then it just kept going and going. Right. But eventually I hit rock bottom and decided that I was going to change my life. And I did stay clean and sober for the first time, like a year, moved down to Atlanta. I was dating this professional wrestler, ended up, you know, working at a bar, hello, and started drinking again and, and, you know, partying it up. And, you know, when I say do drug, do, do drugs, that's the other thing too. Like when you think of someone you go, Oh, they did drugs. You wouldn't look at me and think I did drugs. I mean, I was like modeling. I was a bikini model. I mean, there were yeah. all, I was doing a lot of high profile stuff. So not all people doing drugs look a certain totally. way. That's the other thing I need to tell you, mm -hmm. you know? And so what happened with that is, you know, like I stopped drinking again. So I, so I went into rehab, stayed sober for about a year, started drinking again. And then by 25, I hit rock bottom, not in the way that you would think, because I still had a job and I was, you know, blah, blah, blah. it was more rock bottom emotionally, or should I say situationally? Like I found myself you know, at a hotel on the other side of Atlanta, South side Atlanta with no purse and no way to get to my job that morning. And I'm just like, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this anymore. And I stopped and I stayed sober. My God, I met my husband. We had our children and it wasn't until I had moved to Florida and my mailman had given me a bottle of wine as a welcome to the neighborhood gift and I kept it under my sink. But, and so here, when I was in Florida, you know, you look around and I'm, now I'm a member of a country club that's on the ocean. And, you know, I'm watching these ladies. And by the way, I didn't grow up like that. Yeah. So just remember, like I was Navy, like I, I was just talking about this yesterday, our house and our family of five, we lived in a 1200 square foot home. Wow. Right. This is how I grew up. So, and so, you know, here I am, I'm at this and I'm watching all these ladies walk around in their bikinis and they're holding their cocktails. And I'm like, oh, that looks so glamorous. Right. And so, you know, at that point I'm like, well, it's not like I would ever do drugs again. And I never have done, done drugs again. So, but what's wrong with a little wine? Because wine is classy, right? <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm drinking, uh, you know, what is it? Wild Turkey anymore. <laughs> listening to Leonard Skinner. So, so anyway, I did start drinking again and that was a whole thing. But when I did my own podcast and kind of gave my story and announced that I was officially quitting drinking after New Year's, by the way, you and I are supposed to get together at New Year's <laughs> around that time. There was nothing remarkable. Like I can't really tell you. I mean, yes, that, you know, New Year's Eve when I was driving home, I ended up, um, you know, my daughter was driving. And I don't remember a lot of it, to be honest with you. It kind of hit me at once, the champagne, but my daughter's driving and I, I did like go to hit her. She had said something to me and that's not cool. So, so in that way, that wasn't cool, but you know, in general, it's not like some major thing. She's an adult, by the way, you know, she was probably mouthing off in some way, but no, but anyway, you know, it wasn't some major thing. And so all these years in between I can't tell you that it was like, you know, oh, I went to jail or, well, I did go to jail a couple of times, but those were way earlier in my life. That's a whole other story. <laughs> but, you know, in my drinking, you know, I didn't get pulled over for DUI. You know, what, what wasn't any of that. But for me, 
I wasn't living to my highest potential, right? I wasn't able to do the things I wanted to do. And I was starting to notice it and the weight was creeping up. So it was like a series of events. But anyway, I cannot tell you how many women have reached out to me since I did that podcast talking about why I quit drinking and them sharing their stories. Because, you know, I think so many times, you know, the rationale in your own head is, well, you know, again, it's not like I'm, you know, standing in front of a bar taking off my clothes or, you know, I'm, you know, not paying my bills or, you know, you, all these things right. that you think of when you, when you think of that. I think the hardest place to be is in drinking purgatory, which is you're really in the middle, right? Like there's really nothing bad. <laughs> yeah, you have a headache. Yeah, you're probably gaining, right? But is it serving you? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I'm not like an advocate to say everybody needs to stop drinking, but I will tell you 100%, it's only been since January 1st. I can tell you I've gotten more done in this first half of my year than I was able to get done in six months in years past, just by the sole fact that I'm not drinking. And I didn't even drink all the time. Right. I was a, I was really more of like a, well, really I was a binge drinker. Like if you want to think about it, that binge drinker, when I say that, I mean like, you know, I might go two months without drinking. Right. But when you drink, you're going to have 10 drinks. Yeah. But right. But then there might be the time that, you know, there's a bunch of events and I'm going out with my girlfriends and I seem to be drinking every night. I may not be drinking five drinks. You know, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. But anyway, yes. I did find it interesting that so many women reached out and said, oh my gosh, you are me. And you just helped me decide that I'm not going to do this anymore. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, what's interesting is that I actually stopped drinking back in the fall. And because I found myself in a similar situation where it was like, I never drank ever until I, and then when I moved to Newport beach, it's like, there's a social event every single night and ev all the people I hang out with, they're not alcoholics, but they drink every night, you know? And they're all like Christian ladies, you know? And I'm like, oh, well, I'll have a glass of wine too. Oh, I'll have a margarita too. And then I'm feeling like crap every day. And I finally realized in the fall, I was like, you know what? Like, how is this helping me in my life? Like, do I have, so I did a test. I was like, I went to Friendsgiving and I was like, let me see if I have just as much fun as I had last year without a drop of alcohol. And I came home and I was like, I feel amazing. I woke up early the next morning. I was like, I feel better. I don't want to drink anymore. Anyways, I think it's something that we, it starts to be socially acceptable because it's a socially acceptable drug. I mean, let's just call it what it is. And I actually am an advocate for more people to be sober because, you know, it's like they call it spirits for a reason. There's some spirits that come into you with certain liquors and certain alcohols that are not good, you know? And why even invite that type of spirit into my life? I want to be single minded. I want to be completely focused on my mission. And that kind of stuff doesn't accentuate it. It brings confusion. It, you know, all of those things. And so obviously this is like a total tangent. I didn't know we were going to go on today, but I think it's what mommy millionaires need to hear right now, because there's this culture of moms specifically where, especially in the younger age group where it's like, oh, you know, kids are down for the night. I'm going to have my glass of wine. M mommy juice. And that's, become, yeah. it's become a coping mechanism. So I think people need to hear that, like, you know, it's, it's okay. It's kind of like, it's totally okay. If you don't want to drink, you know, it's starting to be super, super cool, which I really love. I think, you <laughs> yeah. know, probably about five years ago, remember there was like, well, you know, you had Kathy Lee Gifford and Hoda who had the wine every morning. I mean, listen, these are things I would watch. I'd be like, hmm, well, they're doing it, right? There was always this, which that in itself, the fact that I even had to do that, like even think about it like that. And the other thing you, you brought up, which I think is really interesting, because you know, my husband and I, we are involved in a lot of Christian groups, wonderful people. And there are some of the groups that will go do events and there's no drinking. And then there are other groups that we'll go to. And so I'm always, I'll always sit back and observe, like, why do the, you know what I mean? Like this group, it's not okay. The Erwin McManuses of the world, that's, you know, not that it's not okay. Like he's so funny. 
I don't know if you know Erwin McManus. He's the pastor of Mosaic Hollywood. Well, he's got several churches, but Mosaic Hollywood was his first one. And actually, he's the one that brought my husband to Christ. My husband was Jewish. Oh my gosh. Wow. Oh yeah. That's so awesome. I'll, you know, we'll go to dinner and I'm like, Erwin, so alcohol, you know, cause I, what do, what do you think? And he'd be, I'd say, is it evil or how I would say it? He'd, he'd say, well, oh, I'd say, is it in the scripture that you shouldn't drink? And he'd say, well, you know, there's something about, but really, it's really just stupid. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, by the way, it's like, you know, it's, you're really ultimately just stupid. But it is interesting because I would look at like which groups drink, but I love what you said and I agree with you and I've heard that before and you're right. Like there is a reason it's called spirits, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there mm -hmm. is a reason it's called spirits. It definitely lowers, you know, your, your vibration. It yes, definitely exactly. lowers, you know, your mental state. It, mm -hmm. you're, turn, you're tuning your antenna into something lower, I think. So, yeah. So is your husband on the same page with you? My husband has never been a drinker. Funny story. When we met and I had went out with him, he kept bothering me to go out with him. And I finally went out with him this night. He actually, I met him in front of a bar because he had just opened a bar in Buckhead. He was 24 <laughs> years old. And he was like trying to get girls into the bar. And so I was walking by and he was like, hey, come on in. And I, and I wasn't drinking at that point, by the way. I was 25, wasn't drinking. I was 28 by then. But we had a conversation. And so he ended up, you know, bothering me and bugging me. And I went out with him. And at dinner, he sucked down two Captain Morgans and Cokes. And here's me, the non-drinker. I'm like, oh right. my God, alcoholic, bar owner. Okay, this guy's not for me. Red flag. Funny <laughs> enough, I could probably count on one hand how many times he's drank since then. We've been together for 28 years, married 26. Like, wow. he's not a drinker. And so that was another thing. You know, I was in a book club. We called a booze club, right? When I was raising mm. my kids. And- I would just, we everywhere all drink. It was all about the drinking. And I'll never forget because I'd be like, well, I don't know, John Gordon's in town. I always call him by his first and last name. John Gordon's in town. He's not traveling. You know, I can't drink. I got to get home. And, you know, my girlfriend, my one girlfriend, I remember her saying like, well, honey, this is who he married. And I'm like, mm. actually, no, it's not. Like when he married me, I wasn't a drinker. And so he's never liked it. He's never liked Aww. it. And he used to be very kind of, I don't want to say manipulative about it. He would, he would emphasize, like, if we would go out and I would drink, he would kind of, like, make up things that I would do. Like, you know, do you remember kissing that guy's bald head? Or, you know, it was like somebody's grandpa. or so You know, like, but he would, like, always make it into something it wasn't. So I couldn't really believe everything he said. Right. So at that point I would never listen to him. And, um, <laughs> the day that I quit drinking because he was always that way and didn't like it. And I always, it always had become for me about how I was going to protect myself because I, and not physically, he would never hit me, but like, you know, that I would get up and he would start like, did you know you did this? Did you know you did that? Did and so it just became like a, you know, okay, what did I do? I had to think about what I had done just so I could, could, I had, ha I had to have an answer for everything he was going to say. Mm. And actually that new year's day, this new year's day after, um, I didn't even really tell you exactly what happened, but basically because I was kind of hiding my drinking from him, right? Like, cause he had said to me, like, are you going to drink? That was the other thing. The minute he would say to me, are you going to drink tonight at this party or at this event? For some reason, that would be the night that I would drink too much because I then it became like, I'm going to drink and I'm, and I wouldn't, you know, like I would just kind of drink and he wouldn't notice, but you know, I would drink too fast. So instead of right. like enjoying a lovely glass of wine, I'd be like drinking. And then, you know, God bless my girlfriends. You know, they always had my back, right? Cause they wanted me to drink with them and they'd like keep passing me drinks. And I'm a guzzler. So, I mean, I guzzle water. I, gu I guzzle everything, sparkling, whatever it is. And so anyway, New Year's Eve, we were at a friend's house and I just 
drank too much. And it, it just hit me at once. Like I was totally fine. John said, you know, you seem fine. And then all of a sudden I looked over and he goes, you were like lobster eyes. Like one of your eyes was going that way. <laughs> and so anyway, when I woke up in the morning, I, you know, did the same thing that you do when you drink too much. I woke up and kind of looked, looked around with one eye, like, okay, where am I? Did I drive? So there were definitely some things there about drinking too much, right? But I went out to see him prepared, right? I kind of come up in my mind with all the ways that I was going to answer what he might have coming at me. And he asked me how I felt. I told him horrible. I was probably still drunk, really. And then, you know, he asked me, like, do, do you remember hitting Jade? That was the thing. And I said, no, I didn't. And then he just looked at me. It was like his whole face just softened. And he was just like, you know what? You really just need some grace. You need love. And he hugged me. And I don't know what it was about that. Kayla, I feel like I want to cry right now because I haven't really told the story that much. I told on my own pot, but I haven't really been telling it. But, you know, it was kind of like my heart cracked open. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, what am I doing? What am I doing? This is, this is crazy. I'm 55 years old, by the way, right? Like, what am I doing? And I have to tell you, I prayed to God right then. And I have not had the urge to drink since. And I am so grateful for that. Now, I'm not saying there are a couple of times and I realize it has more to do with my blood sugar, like my sugar, because I love also sweets, which I try to stay away from. The only times that I'll even have even thought about it, like I don't think about it, is we might be at a nice restaurant and I'll see like a colored, like a pink or, you know, like a margarita, or something like that. That will, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll look and yeah. go, oh, that looks good. But it's that not like fun. it's not like I have to have one, you know, and I, I really do feel like that that chapter's closed and I'm grateful That's to God. Amazing. I hope I really just pray every day, like, continue, you know, please, you know, keep, keep me going the way I'm going. And, you know, God willing, I, I feel like, I feel like I have a lot to do Kayla and there's no way that I could do this next half of my life drinking anymore. So, Ugh. well, I am so thankful that you were willing to share that story because I think it's what, a lot of people needed to hear whether they can relate to it on the direct level, but maybe it's something else that they, that has a stronghold over them. Right. Cause that's really what that was, was a stronghold. And then the fact that John, who you guys have this best selling book together, relationship grit, and you know, he was able to just, I think be a picture of Jesus to you in that moment of no matter what you've done, I love you. And That doesn't happen in a 28 year relationship without there being a lot of relationship grit, you know? And so I just think that's a beautiful story that he was able to give you what you needed in that moment. That's exactly right. You absolutely Mm -hmm. explained it very well. That's the truth. 